All right, guys, welcome to Refrigeration. Advanced Refrigeration is our second podcast. We thought a bunch of you guys were requesting doing information on rollback valves and ambient pressure control and stuff like that. We're going to go off the. Before we get started, kind of jumped into the first podcast without really doing the introductory stuff on us. So, Kevin, go ahead. So, my name is Kevin Compass. I'm from the Chicagoland area. Uh, I've been doing supermarket refrigeration for probably close to 10 years now. A lot, most of my time is spent doing startup and commissioning of new and used stores and a lot of EMS commissioning and set up and install. I primarily work for the construction department now as their service guy slash startup guy, kind of just travel all over and pretty much had my hands just about every customer and done just about everything in the supermarket side and some larger industrial stuff also. So that's, that's my background. Go ahead and give yours, Brett. You know, my name is Brett Wetzel. If I count my age three, I've been doing this probably around 17 years. Mm-hmm. I hope that was a sneeze and not a laugh, fucker. So me, uh, I started off I, when I got out of high school, I went to school for electronic engineering. Doug went up to doing as far as like, it's it boring. Game play play and it just wasn't for me. So I started going to school for refrigeration, HVAC, uh, worked my way up. And basically I've been, I worked on anything from a five ton mini split up to a thousand horsepower and one year degrees. I was up in Connecticut for about five years before I moved out to Texas. Originally, we started to help start the EMS branch out of Connecticut. Then realized how much I hated snow. And now I'm down here in Texas. I'm a level seven technician out in the DFW area, the Dallas Fort Worth area. Now my position is basically I travel anywhere from Oklahoma, San Antonio, Austin. Rio Grand Valley, Victoria, Corpus Christi, all over Texas, and basically resolving issues for for some of the customer. If we have a new customer that our dogs aren't really up to, as far as the the technology, I train on that. I also do one-on-one training. Usually what we'll do is find a store that's either in some rough shape or needs some TLC or has ongoing issues, and we'll just uh, keep keep working, keep generating calls so we can get one-on-one training. A lot of, a lot of guys out in the field, they, they do better with hands-on rather than the, the, the whole book and reading thing. So, I mean, that, that's why we, I ended up starting to, to do this. Yeah. Tonight, we're going to talk about headmasters, band cycling control. Yeah. What, what do you got, Kev? What do we got with? So I think we'll, I think it's a great topic for tonight. Seems like half the South is frozen right now. So let's just kind of dive into it. So, I mean, the first thing we're going to talk about is fan cycling control. Now we're going to go over it in both aspects of being on a single unit or being in a rack application. So we're going to start off with a single unit. So we have a single condensing unit used in refrigeration or HPS. When it's colder out, we need to control the, our, our delta P, which would be our pressure drop across the system from liquid pressure to suction pressure. Now, every metering device is sized for a delta P. Now, if you look at it, Sporlin, Alco, everybody has charts that show what what happens to that valve. As you make, as you reduce that delta pressure, so that liquid suction pressure, you're going to you're going to make your valve smaller. As you increase that that pressure difference, you're going to make that valve larger. So what we have to do is we have to run this fine line of keeping that valve, the head pressure up large enough, the delta P up large, high enough up to keep that valve to be able to feed our coils properly, properly sized. So as you lower your delta P, you're going to derate your valve. So we have to maintain a certain level of head pressure or saturated condensing temp, SCT, to feed our cases or valves or walk-ins everything has to be proper proper amounts of flow so their first line of defense the first way to try to do this would be with fan cycling so fan cycling would be used 
pressure switch or a PLC control the fan turning on and off, whether it's off pressure switch or contact or cycling, but we're turning that fan on and off based on either temperature of our liquid or our actual pressure would be better. So we're using a pressure switch to cycle the fan on and off. Now what this accomplishes is it keeps our delta P to a certain certain number minimum, but what it does it makes this switch. Your head pressure may be going from 180 pounds to 250 pounds. And this is an example. Now that swinging causes your delta P to go from bare minimum to really high. And what that causes is it causes hunting in the valves. I mean, it doesn't cause steady liquid temperature and pressure. It causes your valves to hunt all over the place. So, I mean, fan cycling works in areas where it's warmer. But once you get up by me in Chicago, yeah, fan cycling will work for a couple months of winter. But like right now, it's five degrees outside and it's not going to cut it. Once you get down to like minus 10, fan cycling is no longer going to cut it on a single year. I mean, you're going to have to flood the condenser. So it does have its limitations below like 30 degrees. I feel that fan cycling is a, is a poor means of head pressure. It causes premature fan motor failure, coil failure. And on certain condensing units, depending on the compressor model, that compressor model may be air cooled. So you may not be able to shut a fan off at all if it's air cooled. So that is like the basic intro into like single units on a rack. I mean, obviously we're utilizing fan cycling. We're able to control everything a little bit better. I mean, we may have anywhere from one to 10 fans, maybe 12. So, I mean, we, we can control our fans a lot better on a rack using a computer to step our fans back, but still cycling those fans after a certain ambient it's no longer going to cut it. So fan cycling will no longer be able to make that, that head pressure. I mean, if it's, if it's five degrees outside, I mean, you, we had a rack the other day that I started up and it had cycled the fan three times in 12 hours. I mean, it was zero degrees in Chicago. So you can only imagine if, if, if it didn't have, if it didn't have condenser flooding valves, I mean, that rack wouldn't be running right now. It just, just doesn't have doesn't have the load in the wintertime in order to accomplish this. So, I mean, there's plenty of, plenty of systems out there that, that require flooding. And once you get up north, I mean, it's a must. If those valves aren't there, fan cycling's not going to cut it. So that's my view of fan cycling and how it works. I mean, Brett, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I do want to. Hey, you were talking about delta P for a second and like sizing the valve. And I just want a good rule of thumb when, when you are basically trying to figure out what the valve is supposed to be because it has the, the delta P in the liquid and the suction pressure does get lower. The valve appears actually smaller. So if you look at the Sporlin TXV sizing chart for a lot of the different valves, let's just say we're dealing with a one ton valve. Okay. And well, that one, that valve is a one ton valve at 150 pound pressure drop. At, at 100 degree liquid, if you start changing any of those numbers, higher or lower, excuse me, it's going to change the size of the of the expansion valve, and that's what we okay. need to. One of the other things before we start really delving into the rest of the fan cycling and stuff, I do want to make sure I want to go over some terminology to make sure you guys do understand this. One of the biggest questions I get, especially deal with rack refrigeration, how do I know if my head pressure is we, we accomplish this by making sure the condenser is achieving what we refer to as TV. Basically, the difference between the ambient temperature and your saturated condensing temperature. So, let's just say for argument's sake, we are at 100 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And the TV labeled on our condenser is 10 degrees. So that means that our saturated condensing temperature, which is our pressure of our, of our drop leg converted to a temperature should be 10 degrees higher than what the ambient is. We have a 10 degree TV, which would bring us up to about 110 degrees saturated. Most racks, you're talking about low temp racks, 
the TD on low temp rack is typically anywhere from eight to 12 degrees. Medium temp rack, 12 upwards of like 17, upwards 18. If you have a, if you have a split temperature rack, where basically you have a low and medium temp together, it's going to be somewhere in the ballpark of that middle of that. And then also you have single and split system. We're going to be the wheelhouse of about 20 degrees on that. So for instance, let's say you're working on a unit that's inside, self-contained, condensers inside. We are at 75 degrees inside the store. So if I said we have a need you degrees on to that ambient, which is great. We lost 95. So that means if you or in that unit was charged properly and had a constant load on it, you would be, or you, you check your pressure and basically you'd have 95 degrees saturated condensing temp. I just want to go over some of that stuff just when we start using those terms as we, as we go through this to make sure that everyone understands what we're talking about. One of the other things about fan psych on, you haven't started start talking about the, how you can set it. Is that what you want to do? Yeah. So basically you need to look over your, when you're, when you're going over setting up, basically, you need to look over your entire system, just check that, see what your minimum, your minimum Delta pressure needs to be. So generally my rule of thumb is I, I like to go a little more lean than I, than most guys, but I try to maintain my fan cycling at a 70 degree saturated condensing temperature. Now that, that is a lower Delta P. A lot of guys will say the hundred pound rule. Like they say your Delta pressure has to be a hundred pounds from suction to discharge. Now that is rule of thumb that doesn't apply in 90% of scenarios. What you guys, I mean, we'll, we'll share one of these charts in the, in, in a link when we, under the podcast is if you look at the spoil and valve sizing chart, like Brett was showing, there's a correction factor for Delta P as you lower, lower that Delta P, it'll, you apply the correction factor to the valve sizing. So say that valve's good for one ton and your load's 8,000 BTUs and you apply that correction factor and it knocks that valve down to. 9,000 B or 8,000 BTUs. Okay. You're still good. You're still going to be the coil. You're still going to accomplish that. So you're, you're at that 70 degree condensing mark. You're still going to accomplish that. Well, as you lower your head pressure, your liquid temperature also comes down. So that offsets your loss from your Delta P in most cases. So that's why the hundred pound rule is so much of a caveat. I mean, you could run 80, 75 to 80, most, most standard valves and EVs, you can get down to 50 to 75 Delta P's. So that, that's where we're coming up with the number from. I, I like to run 70 to 75, my fan cycling. If I'm going, if I'm going to run fan cycling. So my cut out of my fan at 75. Usually anywhere from a 30 to 50 pound dead band to make sure you're not short cycling a fan uh, on a single unit. On our rack, obviously, we're, we're doing differently than PLCs, cycling fans based on a target. So that's that's a whole different scenario. That That's a lot smoother. But you're going to have a swing, especially if you, have, if you have multiple fans, then I set my fan. 10 pounds from each other so like the first one may be 75 then the next one will be eight or i'll go degrees i'm sorry so like 75 next one will be 80 then 85 so like five to ten degree increments for my fan cycling try to talk about everything temperatures at a pressure because I mean, when you're talking in terms of pressure i mean now you got to know what further you're dealing with if you're talking in terms of temperature you don't need to know what refrigerator you're dealing with. It's it's all temperature. So like, you're trying to maintain a minimum of like a 70 to 75 degree condensing temperature is what I usually come up with. But you have to check the chart for the Delta P. I mean, if you're slightly undersized in the expansion valve, you may have to bump it up to make up for it, depending on what the manufacturer put in there and what's how they originally sized the system. Yeah, you will you also make sure I agree with that. As a head like I, I've always been taught that you don't want 
that had like that wasn't designed for like if you have fans cycling switches on every single you know, fan butter for let's just say we're dealing with a husband unit and we have four fans right the head ma- headmasters happen to be set for 180 i mean you're not going to run your saturated condensing temperature trying to run your fans bring your head pressure down all the way down to let's just say we're dealing with r22 right and you said 75 75 degrees saturated that breaks down to 132 well you have a headmaster on there you're not going to obviously put that for honor 32 if your headmaster is holding back at all. correct and like I, I was going more so over like units without without okay. headmasters so like just 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 single I, I obviously like yeah that, that's a great point you're gonna you're gonna have to make it if it has a headmaster it's obviously gonna have to be your your fan cutouts gotta ha- have to be higher than your headmaster or they're gonna fight each other and your last fan should technically be on for that headmaster to work. I mean, you, you, you don't really want to cycle off the last fan. I mean, you're going to, your, your liquid pre- temperature is going to be all over the place. And, and I, I do the same, same rule, but I, I do 10 pounds. So like if for argument's sake, we're at for our head finister, I'll do 190 for our cutout for our fans. I do about 30 pounds heavier than that for the cut in. So 190 and then go 10 pounds higher for the cutting cut out with it yeah. now whether you're dealing with whether you're dealing with supermarket rack or you're dealing with a, a split system i mean the, the way that you cycle those fans is imperative you should always start first one on last one off should be the one right on right at your header right where the right where the discharge and the, and the drain, drain uh, your drop leg lines leave the a couple reasons one is is thermal expansion contraction you don't want to be heating midway up through the, through the coil. Second thing is, which can definitely happen is where you have the drop leg pressure could potentially get higher than your, uh, than your discharge pressure when you're turning fans on midway in your condenser. That's why if you do have any kind of liquid feed issues, it's imperative. A, obviously make sure that your coil is clear, but also making sure that your, your, all your fans are actually running when they should be, not that it's basically catching pockets of refrigerant and just kind of hanging out in that one colder section of the coil. That, that, that's a good point. So that kind of wraps up the fan cycling area. Obviously, we're still going to talk about some fan cycling as we go move on. Brett, do you want? One of the other things about fan cycling, I think, should I start talking about the, how you can set it? Is that what you want to do? Yeah, so basically you need to look over your when you're when you're going over setting up fan you need to look over your entire system, just check that, see what your minimum your minimum delta pressure needs to be. So generally my rule of thumb is I, I like to go a little more lean than I than most guys, but I try to maintain my fan cycling at a seventy degree saturated condensing temperature. Now that, that is a lower delta P. A lot of guys will say the 100-pound rule. Like, they say your delta pressure has to be 100 pounds from suction to discharge. Now, that is rule of thumb. That doesn't apply in 90% of scenarios. What you guys, I mean, we'll, we'll share one of these charts in, the, in a link when we under the podcast is, if you look at the spoil and valve sizing chart like Brett was showing, there's a correction factor for delta p as you lower lower that delta p it'll you apply the correction factor to the valve sizing so say that valve's good for one ton and your load's 8,000 btus and you apply that correction factor and it knocks that valve down to 9,000 b or 8,000 btus okay you're still good you're still going to feed the coil you're still going to accomplish that so you're you're at that 70 degree condensing mark you're still going to accomplish that while as you lower your head pressure, your liquid temperature also comes down. So that offsets your loss from your delta P in most cases. So that's why the 100 pound rule is so much of a caveat. I mean, you could run 80, 75 to 80, most, most standard valves and EVs, you can get down to 50 to 75 delta p's so that that's where we're coming up 
number from I, I like to run 70 to 75 my fan cycling if I'm going if I'm going to run fan cycling. So my cutout of my fan at 75, usually anywhere from a 30 to 50 pound dead band to make sure you're not short cycling a fan uh, on a single unit. On a rack, obviously, we're, we're doing differently the PLCs cycling fans for on a target. So that's that's a whole different scenario. That that's a lot smoother. But you're gonna have a swing out of especially if you have if you have multiple fans, then I set my fan up ten pounds from each other. So like the first one may be seventy five, then the next one will be eight or I'll go degrees, I'm sorry. So like seventy five. Next one will be eighty, then eighty five. So like five to ten degree increments for my fan cycling. Try to talk about everything temperature instead of pressure, because I mean, when you're talking in terms of pressure, I mean now you got to know what refrigerant you're dealing with. If you're talking in terms of temperature, you don't need to know what refrigerant you're dealing with. It's it's all temperature. So like, you're trying to maintain a minimum of like a seventy to seventy five degree condensing temperature is what I usually come up with. But you have to check the chart for the delta p. I mean if you're Slightly undersized in the expansion valve, you may have to bump it up to make up for it, depending on what the manufacturer put in there and what's how they originally sized the system. Yeah, you will you also make sure I agree with that. As a head manufacturer, like I, I, I've always been taught that you don't want the head, like it wasn't designed for, like if you have fan cycling switches on every single you know, fan motor for, let's just say we're dealing with a Husman unit and we have four fans. Right, the head ma- headmaster happened to be set for 180. I mean, you're not going to run your saturated condensing temperature, trying to run the fan, bring your head pressure down all the way down to let's just say we're dealing with R22, right? And you said 75, 75 degrees saturated that breaks down to 132. Well, if you have a headmaster on there, you're not going to obviously put that for 132 if your headmaster is holding back. At a- Correct. And- like, I- I was going more so over like units without without okay. masters. So like just 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 single. I, obviously, like yeah, that that's a great point. You're gonna you're gonna have to make it if it has a headmaster. It's obviously gonna have to be your your fan cutouts got to ha- have to be higher than your headmaster, or they're gonna fight each other. And your last fan should technically be on for that headmaster to work. I mean, you 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 don't really want to cycle off the last fan. I mean, you're gonna your your liquid pre- temperature is gonna be all over the place. And and I I do the same same rule, but I, I do ten pounds. So like if for argument's sake we're at run head canister, I'll do 190 for our cutout for our fans. Do about 30 pounds heavier than that for the cut in. So 190 and then go 10 pounds higher for the cutting cut out with it. Now, whether you're dealing with, whether you're dealing with supermarket rack or you're dealing with a uh, split system, I mean, the, the way that you cycle those fans is imperative. You should always start first one on, last one off should be the one right on, right at your header, right where the, right where the discharge and, and the drain, drain like your drop leg lines, leave it in depth. A couple of reasons. One is, is thermal expansion contraction. You don't want to be heating midway up through the, through the coil. Second thing is, which can definitely happen is where you have the drop leg pressure that could potentially get higher than your than your discharge pressure when you're turning fans on midway in your condenser. That's why if you do have any kind of liquid feed issues, it's imperative a obviously make sure that your coil is clear, but also making sure that your your all your fans are actually running when they should be. Not that it's basically catching pockets of refrigerant and just kind of hanging out in that one colder section of the coil. That, that that's a good point. So that kind of wraps up the fan cycling area. Obviously, we're still going to talk about some fan cycling as we go move on. Brett, do you want to uh, break into headmasters? Sure. Are we just talking about no OROA? What we're doing? So I want to go over first, like the OROA at like the LAC three pipe headmasters, and then we'll build on. I think we'll build on top of that uh, other stuff. Okay. All right, so masters like the uh, when we talked about on the last podcast, we were talking about the holdback valve and the receiver. 
position. Yeah. Basically, the yeah. whole purpose is to make sure we're maintaining a minimum saturated condensing temperature. Basically, you're being under pressure, convert in, into a temperature, right? For instance, we the valve might be set for uh, 180 pounds, so it's not going to allow the condenser pressure at lower than 80. We have uh, master typically has three lines. We have a discharge gas line that's connected to it, and that's getting fed right off the off the discharge line. We have the receiver out, um, and then we also have the condenser in. Basically, that valve is typically going to have the discharge bypass line shut if the pressure is above 180. We, uh, that bypass line is basically going to end up feeding into the, uh, into the, re into the receiver. As the pressure starts to go down, you have either a wicked wind where it's bringing the, bringing the pressure down when it's, when it's really, really cold out and your pressure continues to delve down. What's going to happen is your line coming out of your condenser into, into your receiver is basically going to start blocking off the line going into our, I'm sorry, coming out of the condenser. And by doing that, you're basically almost like shutting the valve and, and forcing that to go up because you're forcing more refrigerant, more liquid refrigerant in that coil. As that pressure starts to go, uh, as it's opening, the discharge line is basically going to then start bypassing a little bit of refrigerant back into the, uh, back into the receiver. And once again, that's to make sure that we don't fall flat on our face when the thing that when the headmaster starts to block off and the pressure starts to condenser, well, like I said, the, the receiver pressure is going to start to drop. So to accommodate that, that's the whole reason for the, having the bypass on there. If you a little bit of gas in there, it can help push that liquid that's in the receiver out to the case and still be able to maintain our, our minimum saturated condenser. Temperature. And be mindful this system will not work properly if the system is not charred. The first system we were talking about was just fan cycling. Anything that really has fan cycling to make sure you do have a full charge. In the summertime, you do want to make sure you have about 20%. Talking about headmasters now, we want to make sure that we have 50% in that receiver. Well, the reason being is because, you know, we're basically raising the head pressure by throwing more liquid into our condenser well we're only throwing more liquid in our condenser when it starts getting cooler outside the colder it gets the tighter molecule, molecules get in, in the in the refrigerant the refrigerant takes up less space so we need more refrigerant that that's in stowage to be able to throw into the condenser to be able to raise up that pressure yep so the way so I like to go over the OROA valve first. So an o the OROA valve is basically standard headmaster. It's applied across all kinds of mid-sized units. So the way the OROA valve works is it has a built-in check valve on the discharge side. So you want to have a check valve on this, on the discharge line of it. So that way during shutdown operation, you're not potentially allowing liquid to seep back into the discharge and uh, cause a flooded start or a slug of any kind. So there's a check valve built in. You have three pipes coming in. You have your uh, discharge. You're going to tee off your discharge line before it goes to the condenser. Typically right after the oil separator, if you have one or if it's just standard small units, there's going to be a compressor. If that line's going to feed into the OROA discharge inlet. Now, out the, the next pipe coming in is going to go to your condenser drop leg. Now, when I say drop leg, it's just a term that is typically applied. I could be called drain leg, drop leg, condenser outlet. It's just the liquid outlet of the condenser. So it's going to come to your drop leg. And it's going to tie into the valve. Now, the last outlet is going to be going to your receiver. So that's going to be your receiver line. So this valve uses all three of these, and it is essentially a three-way valve. So as one port gets pushed shut, the other port opens. So as the condenser outlet port gets closed off, the discharge port gets open to allow flow to go to the 
receiver because as we're holding back in the condenser, remember we still have to keep that minimum pressure in the receiver. So as it's holding back in the condenser, it's opening that port to allow more flow to the receiver from the discharge in order to pressure on the top of the liquid and the inside the top of the receiver, keep that, that discharge pressure in there. I mean, it's not a ton of it, but it's enough to keep the pressure on top of the receiver to keep your liquid flowing and keep your, your minimum delta pressure to feed your valves. The way this valve works is it has a nitrogen charge in a dome. So it's got a static charge set to, say if it's a 180 pound set point valve, it's set to 180. If it's a 150 pound set point, it's set to 150, with whatever the dome is, is charged with. And it's stamped on the valve. So that isn't how an OROA works. Swirlin also makes a smaller version called an LAC. LAC valves can be the same way. Some of them are dual pressure valves, meaning when you clip the pigtail, it releases that. And there's a spring in an LAC that allows it to be a different setting. That valve requires an external check valve to be installed in the discharge line in order to prevent that flood back. Uh, one quick thing, I mean, a lot of guys will say this, if, if a headmaster does lock up on you completely and it is just, it's not low on charge, guys will say to clip, clip the pigtail off there and release the, the pressure in there. Well, I mean, that works sometimes, but if the valve's locked up, I mean, releasing that pressure usually doesn't do it. If releasing that, if you cut that pigtail and it releases the pressure on the dome, and that valve stops bypassing, it was probably low on refrigerant to begin with. Not, not a uh, headmaster issue. I see a lot of headmasters get condemned that aren't bad. And guys clip that. And the thing you got to be mindful of, here's the issue. If it does lock up and it is a failed headmaster, what happens is sometimes you get bleed through from the valve, into the diaphragm into that dome. And if you get liquid refrigerant in there, what happens is it pushes down the dome. And you release that. And if it is refrigerant in there, it's bleeding through. So when you go to clip that, it's either A, leak going to be leaking out of there, and it, or it could blow the entire system charge out of there. I've seen that happen when an apprentice goes to cut the line. He goes to clips the cap tube, and it just starts blowing liquid up because the dome is ruptured. I mean, there's nothing you could do besides change the headmaster. In a pinch, I mean, it's not something you want to do, but I've welded a pigtail on there and it to the suction in order to get it going. I mean, that's a kind of like a bush fix, but either here nor there, I mean, still the headmaster has to get, has to get replaced. So we're going to go over how, to, how these should be charged and how to come up with a charge. Brett, you want well, to take- cover real quick. So you were talking about clipping, like you said, be mindful when you're doing it, but don't, you know, if you are going to try to clip it, don't break it all the way the dome. Usually there's, there's two little divots in it that keeps the charge inside of the dome. Cut it up through after the second thing down there. So God forbid it does continue to dump refrigerant out. You could potentially save the charge by pinching it, pinching it back down. That's one thing that I, that I have learned. Usually, like, like you said, usually they lock up where the discharge pressure is just exuberantly hot, where it's just stuck in that position. Be mindful. I've seen in my career, which isn't really that many, but I've seen about five of them where it actually blows the whole entire top, the whole dome. It actually separated the well. It just blew, blew the whole well right off. And there was pieces in the bottom. I had no charge on the thing. I started charging up with nitrogen, trying to figure where it was and looking around and I see brass and a spray and I'm like, oh, where'd that come from? And basically it was because the dome, it just basically blew its top. So what causes that is it, that that happens when the refrigerant leaks in that dome. It's been, it was probably short cycle pressure for a while. It, it expanded enough from the ambient and it caused the rupture basically. Yeah, so the, just to explain how powerful liquid refrigerant is there, I just saw a post, I think two or three days ago on, on the supermarket tech talk site where a guy showed a picture of, of an oil float where the ball basically looked like someone was chewing on it for the, for the oil float. And that typically happens when you have liquid refrigerant bleeding by. So if the system is off, 
typically on the discharge line going out from the oil separator, you have a check valve there that only allows refrigerant to go in the out direction. Well, if that check valve has happened to fail and the discharge starts bleeding back into the, uh, back into the oil separator, it condenses into a liquid and all of a sudden it doesn't take much where that, that a rupture happens as soon as you start throwing hot discharge gas into there and then potentially crush the ball. Well, same instance, what we're talking about with the, uh, the headmaster, basically that, that violent eruption just expands so dramatically. It just, it, it has to go somewhere to end up busting that top ball. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a worst case scenario right there. So I, I would like to go on to start check, checking the charge and charging these. So, I mean, I, I end up dealing with this a lot since I'm up north. So the way I, I do this, I follow Sporland's document when I do this, the 9030-1. Now, this applies whether it's an LAC valve, ORI, an ORD, set up any kind of single unit, basically, with flooded cadastro controls, whether it's ORI, LAC, like I said, even if they had a full bank valve on it, it's a single unit. So what this does is this is a way to calculate your entire condenser flooding charge. Sporland, what you have to do is you follow this document. I'm going to post the link when we post the podcast to this document. I keep it on my phone. Once you get go through it, it's, it's pretty easy. If you've done it a couple of times. Basically, what Sporland wants you to do is they want you to measure the length of the condenser. They want you to count the number of tubes and the number of U-bends. You figure out your total footage of condenser tubing you have. You figure out your saturated suction temperature. That you figure out your minimum ambient design. And it basically tells you how much you need to flood that condenser, how much refrigerant you need to flood that condenser 100%. So it may stay like, for example, this condenser with all the U-bends and everything else added up, may have a thousand feet of and Sportland may say you need 31 pounds to completely flood this at a minus 20 degree of amp or condenser. Well, we may not need to flood that, that, that condenser unit hundred percent. So there, there's a list the Sportland has of saturated suction temperatures versus ambient. So it may say Say this is a unit that's run a minus 20 degree evaporator and we're running a minus 10 minimum ambient. It may say you need to be flooded 88%. So you only need 88% of that original 100% charge. And it lists different different percentages. Now, if it's summertime, you can figure out your flooding charge right then and there. If you start this unit up or if it's flat, I figure out all my tubing tubing lengths. I write write down the condensing unit as, as I'm doing startup or if I'm using this. I write down the entire tubing length. So that way the next guy doesn't have to do it. And I write down the entire flooding charge, like what it would take to flood 100%. Then I figure out my, my rest of my math and I'll say my, say my flooding charge is 31 pounds. Okay, well, I'll clear my sight glass depending on what the ambient is, you also look at the chart, say if it's 95 degrees, your condenser's flooded, nothing. So you have to add that whole 31 pounds in for your flooding for the winter after you clear the sight glass. Now, if it's 55 degrees outside, you may already be, let's say 40% flooded. So you subtract that from your the amount you have to flood it. So you may only to add in an additional 10 pounds to that unit. Now, that's the problem. I see this a lot with apprentices is they'll get to a unit in the middle of wintertime and it's having head pressure problems, headmaster's bypass, the case is warm, walk-in's warm. Yeah. Well, they go in there and they see the side glass flashing and they see pressures that are low, so they add gas and they top it off and they clear the glass. Well, say it's 40 degrees outside. We'll say like three days later, now it's... 20 degrees outside, units down again. It's having issues again because it didn't have enough liquid in it. So you have to use that flooding chart 
a lot, I see a lot of guys that'll just put a little bit of extra in, and that still may not be enough. It hit minus 20 here last year for a little bit. I, any unit that wasn't properly, that had the proper flooding charge in it, guys were running back to put more gas. And when it's that cold, when it's hit at the minimum ambient you're going to run into, yeah, you could just top it off and you're going to be okay because you're at your minimum ambient design. So one thing to be mindful of, just clearing the glass at five degrees, that unit's going to be low when it gets down to 50 degrees. I mean, it's not going to be flooding. You're, you're going to fix it in the summertime and somebody's going to be back there in the first cold because now you're going to be backing gas up in a condenser that you don't have. So you got to be mindful of that when you're when you're charging these in the summertime. You got to bring your scale up and properly charge single units. So this is a this is a big thing. I mean, once you learn to spoil ninety dash thirty dash one, I mean, it becomes extremely easy to pull this off. And it takes it takes no more than five minutes after you've done it a bunch of times in order to do it. And I mean, if you get good at it and do it on startup, I mean. It's really easy for guys to do it afterwards when they all the mass are already there for them. Yeah, I do actually. Yeah, right. So one thing, you know, you're talking about what what happens when the system's undercharged due to the lower ambient one night versus another. Well, I've seen this many a times. Some of our customers, fortunately for us, they they put on pressure transducers on the on at least on the discharge and the suction pressure, which is extremely helpful. A lot of times, guys will get there and the call will come in by midnight. They have a two or four hour response time. So by the time they get there, it's four, four o'clock in the morning. By the time, you know, they get all the tools and then checking all the pressure and stuff, it might, it might be six o'clock. So at that point, our temperature might've rose from midnight upwards until six o'clock. I mean, the temperature might've went up 20, 30 degrees, which yeah, yeah, it didn't work in the middle of the night when, you know, when it was super cold, but then you get there and all of a sudden now it's working. One of the things you large work at and up. what are you doing if you're fortunate enough to have a uh, discharge and pressure trans unit what you can do is is grab excuse me grab the discharge pressure and see if that pressure actually went below or even well below what that headmaster is set for right i mean headmaster is in fact set for 100, 180 pounds. Technically, if it's working properly and it has enough charge in it, that discharge pressure should not waver from the 180 psi. If you see on the graphs where it starts going down dramatically, that means you a you're trying to pack more for during that condenser, but you're also using a boatload and trying to bypass to keep the pressure up on the other side, which is going to be taking high yeah, or discharge gas from that part of the system. And delivering in the receiver so you're lowering your your head pressure because you're using that pressure as well a lot of times what I'll, I'll have guys do is i'll have them graph the discharge pressure and then also the ambient temperature sensor so you can see exactly okay at 60 degrees everything started actually running pressure so you can kind of see that and if you can graph or at least log three points you can see what's happening with all three points basically you're Case temperature, your discharge pressure transducer, as well as your ambient. You'll see as the ambient temperature started to go up, our discharge pressure started to go up, but then also our case temperature started going down. I just want to add that for a helpful tip. No, that's, that's good. That, that, that kind of leads into the next thing I wanted to talk about, which would be the actual like troubleshooting of this. So I typically like, I, I call it three clamp method. So the way I teach guys to, to troubleshoot headmasters is with three clamps and a pressure transducer or a gauge. I mean, you could do it with two clamps. It's a lot more transparent with three. So what I want to see is when you're checking a headmaster, you're looking at it's setting minimum discharge pressure, not liquid pressure. So that 180 pounds is going to be 180 pounds of your discharge. Your liquid side on your receiver is going to be a little less. It may be like, I, I don't know, bro, what would you say? Like generally like one, 
fifty to one or one sixty to like one eighty. I mean, depending on how it's the your receiver pressure on a, on a headmaster, it's it's generally like anywhere from like five to fifteen yeah. pounds yeah. less. Yeah, your, your discharge. Depending on how how, yeah, how well, much I mean, basically it's taking the same that principle of if you're just instead of it's basically all a headmaster is right is an OR. Well, yeah, but I mean, basically, I mean, yeah. it's it's basically two valves in one and in, in one of your ORI yeah. and your ORD all in one, and basically it's doing the same function. So I, the the principle stays the same, the theory stays the same as far as your your pressure and yeah. So I mean, I'd say those numbers you're right. Yeah. So what? What I have guys do is I have them put a, a probe. I mean, I try to push guys at the probes. I put a probe on the discharge, the compressor, or wherever you have a spot in the discharge line. And then I have them put on the inlet to the headmaster for the discharge, I have them put a temp clamp. And then the outlet of the condenser, I have them put a temp clamp. And the inlet to the receiver, I have them put a temp clamp. Now, the way I do this is your discharge pressure is low. Your receiver temperature is the same as the discharge line temperature. You are low on refrigerant. So you're backing liquid in the receiver, or I'm sorry, in the condenser, and you're pressurizing the receiver just with discharge gas. You're just blowing through. Now, that is a, that is a classic low on refrigerant scenario. So, I mean, that, that is one where... You need to top it off of the refrigerant. Now, if your discharge pressure is high, your discharge temperature is high, and you're also high on your receiver line temperature, that is a stuck valve or a valve that liquid refrigerant has gotten to the dome of the pressure or the regulating valve and it is causing it to increase the, the regulating pressure so that is one where clipping the headmaster may be an option or it's stuck and you may have to cut it out now if your discharge pressure is high and this would be like a summertime application where somebody thinks the headmaster stuck and you're or no, even in the winter your your condenser line temperature is high and your receiver line temperature is high that is a condenser issue that is it's either plugged or your your condenser is impacted with dirt and you're not getting enough you're not rejecting enough heat now the last scenario would be is high discharge pressure cool drop lake temperature condenser all the temp and cool receiver temperature that would be more of like a not condensables issue meaning your your pressure is raised up but you're you're closer to ambient temp so that that would be more of a non condensables issue not a headmaster issue because your your condenser line is cool and your receiver line is cool i mean those those using those temp clamps in those scenarios you could pretty much troubleshoot any headmaster issue Besides the random sticks that happen where if you don't have like EMS monitoring, like Brett was talking about that particular customer, you're not, you're going to have a hard time looking at those unless you're leaving a probe on there. Some probes do data logging this, some benefits to probes, you can pull that data back. But that's how I generally teach guys how to troubleshoot headmasters. And that's how I look at it. And also using the sight glass too. I mean, if your sight glass is flashing, you're generally low on refrigerant. If those, those other scenarios aren't met, you want to keep a clear sight glass and you need to clear that sight glass and then charge that Sporland document. If, if it wasn't charged properly, that Sporland document, you're going to be looking for a leak. It's not there. When somebody recharges thing, it was 95 degrees out and did put the proper amount of flooding charge in there. Yeah, I think, Brett. No, no, I'm, what we got, that's, that's like, great. That's great. When you were, oh, no, I was to go over. Uh, so you're talking about non condensables. That's what I'm bringing this up. Like, non condensables is anything that doesn't belong in the system, uh, anything other than oil or refrigerant. Like, typically, most, most 
supermarket condensers at you'll maybe get about five degrees of stuff out out of the out of the drain leg. Realistically, why they call it a drain leg is 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 because if you practically put a sight glass on it, you wouldn't see a full column of liquid coming down. That's a misconception. You would actually see liquid trickling down and, and vapor actually going back up to get recondensed because basically the the vapor is is the lighter liquid. Even on even on single systems, you don't have you're not gonna have copious amounts of uh, stuff going on there. Sometimes on like uh, eCraft bone, sometimes they'll make a uh, condenser that basically has four different two different passes through it. The first section of, of the pass takes up three quarters or shit, no, not even that. Probably fifteen sixteenths of the whole condenser. Basically, and it's doing the regular condensing, you know, for the, for the unit itself, just to convert, convert that refrigerator into a liquid. But then once it goes into the receiver and back out, it doesn't go straight down, down to the rest of the cases. What it'll do is before that, it'll actually run it through that last 16th of a coil to get some additional sub cooling. They, they, in order to figure out what, what that really should be. You'd have to call eCraft or a bone, basically get a number. Like they'll be able to tell you, oh, it was designed for this. But a good rule of thumb for an external loop typically gives you about 10 extra degrees of sub cooling. But that's just, the, that's my rule of thumb. Because otherwise you're going to be on the phone with eCraft for about an hour and a half to say that they have to get a hold of an engineer and they'll, they'll get back to you in about a day or so. Yeah. That, that's about right, especially with that day or so. <laughs> so the other, the other thing I wanted to go into real quick is on these LAC valves and these OROA valves. Now there is multiple different valves pressure rating. So you have 215, you have a 180, you have a 150, you have a hundred. Now on everything new, this is, I've seen this happen a lot lately this year. Is guys are saying that they have bad headmasters and they're not looking at them. Any new low temp unit is coming out generally with a hundred pound headmaster. New medium temp unit is coming out with a hundred and fifty pound headmaster. So the reason we're doing that is to get that minimum saturated condensing temperature down to around that seventy degree mark, sixty degree, fifty degree, whatever they're going for. Out. This is this is to meet energy requirements. I mean, there is no reason to run a unit at 180 pounds when you can run it at 150. I mean, you're just saving energy and it makes everything more efficient. So this is why we are talking about that minimum delta P. You got to watch when you're sizing stuff. Now, if you're getting a unit with a hundred pound headmaster and it's low temp, I mean, you're 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 generally fine with that. But you also need to make sure if you're installing your expansion valves, it's not installed by the coil manufacturer. You need to look up there. If you've got a 150 pound headmaster, you need to make sure that you're sizing your valve for a 150 pound headmaster. So you, you want to size it at that minimum delta P so that way your valve is big enough during that operation. So that's all DOE requirements for new new cadets and units that are a certain size are 100, 150 pound headmasters. So that's something to keep in mind. I mean, you're going to start seeing some of these 180s and 215s and 210s go away on units. That's why they're starting to get rid, get rid of you chemical and, and everything's really gone to electronic. The, the, the biggest reason for that is because of the range of the electronic expansion. So unfortunately, this is, we get pretty deep, but they basically Kevin and I uh, talked about basically the, the TV on a on evaporator before. Basically, most evaporators are sized for a 10 degree TV. Well, as we all know, on a single, because there's no varying load on the compressor, whatever the suction pressure is in the summertime versus the wintertime, the wintertime is basically going to be, could be upwards of 10 pounds lower. If that's the case, that brings your saturated suction temperature down lower and could potentially change the sizing of your coil because you're running a lower, lower suction pressure. In Texas, we have that problem here more often than not, because a lot of these systems are, are designed. They have to be able to 
be able to work when the outside, outside temperature is 120 degrees. But they also have to make sure they're going to be able to work when it's 30 degrees or in this in, in this week, zero degrees. But we have to make sure that 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 valve is still going to be big enough either direction. So a lot of times the compressors end up being oversized. When you units here in Texas, then come the winter time where basically your suction pressure is a, a whole lot lower now. This causes a, a higher TV on the on the evaporator. And basically what that's going to do is it's going to increase the size of the coil, which means you need a bigger expansion. Valve. So with, with these new regulations, that was the uh, one big caveat where they, they want, they want to make sure they have this electronic expansion valve because of the varying load sizing is, you know, I don't think it's going to be able to be done by a lot of these mom and pop shops anymore, because there's a lot more things that have to, that, that deal with it. Now you, I've had systems in the winter time because the suction pressure is running so low and the unit is so oversized basically the expansion valve the electronic expansion valve is 100 percent open but i'm still running 15 16 degrees of super heat. and it was all because the compressor was basically oversized sorry i'll get off my box yeah i mean we see that a lot out here too that really sizing thing comes into play and TDs, which we can go into that another day. We can have a whole podcast just on understanding TDs. There, there's a lot that goes goes along with that. So, yeah, that, that's basically why we, we need to set that minimum delta P. I would like to go to now the third head pressure control, which would be our ORO and our ORD, which we kind of covered last week, which we'll just go over briefly. I mean, it's doing the same thing as a whole back valve. The only thing is it's adjustable. So it's a better application for than a, than a headmaster. So I would rather, if I'm, if I'm changing a headmaster out of a larger unit, I'm probably not going to put a headmaster back and I'm probably going to go with an ORI. Oh, nah, I'm not going to go with an ORI. I'm going to go with an ORI and a ORD valve. So an, o, an ORI valve is an open on rise inlet pressure so it's going to be mounted on our condenser drain leg or drop leg and it is going to be in between the condenser outlet and the receiver inlet so it is going to be usually in the shape of a it's a right angle valve or angled valve so it's 90 degrees you have an adjustment screw on there it'll cap off and you have an allen screw on there and it can be anywhere from zero to I think it's 225 pounds is your setting on there. So you could adjust your, uh, your condenser pressure that way. I would rather have that valve because I can adjust it and I don't have to run a set pressure to whatever it is. I can set it for whatever my application is. And then you would have an ORD 20. So that's going to be discharge pressure versus receiver pressure. So it's going to be teed in after the ORI valve to the outlet of the ORI valve in between the receiver. So as the ORI valve holds back and gets 10 pounds below or 20 pounds below the receiver, the receiver pressure gets 10, 20 pounds below the discharge pressure. It's going to open up and it's going to start pressurizing that receiver to keep that minimum liquid pressure at a certain amount. So if you set that valve, say at a, 150 pounds and your minimum liquid pressure would be a 130 pounds so it's going to be 20 pounds less so your minimum liquid pressure would be set by that ORD valve so that's how that's how you become your minimum so if you wanted your 70 degree saturation or that number you would set that OR or I to maintain higher so that way your minimum liquid pressure would be that 20 pound difference we were diagnostic on that yeah, we'll go um, over it. No, if you want to delve right into diagnostic, we start. Okay, so I mean, there's not too much to go wrong with this. An ORD valve could stick and just constantly blow discharge pressure into receiver. If there's not a high differential, it shouldn't be. If you don't have a 20 pound drop from discharge to liquid, you shouldn't be injected. It's a spring loaded check valve. I mean, parts fail. You could get debris in it, piece of valve plate, stuff like that. So if that is constantly bypassing, you're going to have high head pressure issues. 
and you're going to be injecting gas all the time. So, I mean, that's something to look out for. Generally, I mean, these valves, I usually only see them fail one way, and that is the internal bellows leak into where the seal cap is, where the adjustment is, it builds up pressure underneath the cap. It's the same way a forearm valve for an EPR would fail. It builds up pressure in there and causes increased spring and causes high pressure issues because now that you have the spring set a certain way, well, that refrigerant, liquid refrigerant that leaked inside of the adjustment area is now expanding and putting pressure on the bellows on the back side. So now that increases your system pressure because now that system pressure has to increase the folds back pressure in a condenser in order to push the bellows open. So generally, like, you need to be real careful when you take these caps off. You need to pay attention. If you hear any refrigerant escape in there, you have a leaking bellows, and that's your problem. If it is bad enough where it is just spraying out, you're pretty much dead in the water. I have in the past. I've done this before on a rack station where we had two of these. I actually took the brass cap off, drilled a hole in it, put a uh, pookie tap on a quarter inch trainer tap on silver soldered on the cap and i vented it to the suction in order to keep the liquid refrigerant out of the space so the valve would run i mean it made it made it through a weekend like that i mean that that's that's like a bush two o'clock in the morning fix if you can't get a valve but it'll work i mean on a single that's a little harder to do because you, you got to pump down everything else but it'll still work I need a tampon, a paper clip, and a piece of gum, and I'll get that thing rolling. <laughs> yeah. So like, like you said before about the, the ORD or the A9 valve right there for the receiver pressurization. When that does feed, if it feeds when it's not supposed to, it will empty, depending on how bad it's feeding, it will basically empty that receiver. The reason why it'll empty the receiver is basically it starts making the discharge pressure and the receiver pressure, because you got to remember that it's feeding discharge gas directly from the discharge into the receiver. So now you basically have reached this equilibrium where, you know, now your discharge pressure and your receiver pressure is the same, which means you have no flow. So that refrigerant is just going to keep stacking and stacking and stacking, you can go stack into, into the condenser. Like you said, also, you will have high head pressure as well. Trying to figure out your TV, your TV will not, will not pan out. It will also appear that you have copious amounts of non condensables in there because you are packing so much refrigerant in there. Basically, your subcoin is going through the roof. You're not going to have that five degree subcoin that I said would be typically typical coming out of a, a rack drain leg. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's basically those NORI ORD setup. I mean, it's extremely simple, it's just like a scaled down version of an eight. A9 setup. It's just is just a headmaster broken apart into two valves. I would rather have an OR an ORD than a headmaster. Just the simple fact that I can adjust it, and it's, it seems to be a little bit more reliable if there is issues. So, right, we're gonna dive into the rack section next. Go over rack, rack pressure control. Sure. The A and A9. I mean, first, first, obviously, you have the. Are we talking about controlling by TV at all, or no? I think we should sure. dive into that in a different podcast because that, that, that could be that's a whole fine. different podcast. Um, so a lot of times you're, uh, you're at the point on your will be set for whatever the main wants, whatever they're trying to maintain, right? You always try to go, you always want to go off with best respect, right? They, they bought and had that equipment engineered and designed for that particular, for what, because what we were talking about before. Electronic expansion valves, they're, they're not, I think, so I have to have a certain delta valve in order for it to work. I mean, they're, they're not limited in that. Athletic. So you're able to basically run the lower head pressure when you have electronic valves. So based off of when the unit, when the rack was designed, did it have, did it have electronic valves or did it have mechanical? And that, that'll be other basis on how they actually have the setting set up on their on their holdback valve and their receiver pressurization valve a lot of times consumers will have the holdback valve set for 70 or 65 degrees saturated condensed temperature so 
the pressure gets lower than that, once again, the hold back valve will start to close down. As that, as that pressure closes, as that valve starts to close down, the, re the pressure on the outlet of air going into the receiver will start to decrease in pressure. Once again, that's when we use the receiver pressurization valve to put discharge gas into that receiver and start start seeding getting <laughs> gas into there, which is going to keep the receiver pressure at a, at a certain saturated temperature there. The like I said, usually customers will have the holdback valve set for well, 70 degrees saturated to 65. And then basically the resaturated for the, for the lower, for the receiver pressure. So a lot of times with glide and refrigerants, we use what's what we refer to as midpoint. A lot of these refrigerants have multiple refrigerants that they're made up of their blends. So they, they, they act differently at, at certain pressures as far as their, their bubble and bubble and dew points. So one of the, one of the important things is when you are setting these up, make sure that you're setting it up for midpoint if that's what they're actually going for a lot of customers they have their own spec got basically telling you exactly where they want their holdback valves where they want this valve set for what they want their ambient their head pressure control set for for instance like in rack refrigeration right when we have a couple different methods of, of head pressure safety right discharge the electronic head pressure control through the ems system will be set typically for about 125 degrees saturated. Head pressure switches, the mechanicals were set for about 30 degrees saturated. So like, these are all things that you'll be able to get through these, the books that are, they're given out from the, the, the store where basically they're, they're telling you what, what all these are set for. Anything you want to add? Yeah. So. Generally, like Brad was talking, you always want to run customer spec. Now, I, I hear this a lot from guys. What if there is no spec? Okay. A lot of times, manufacturers spec things that are extremely high or realistic. So, generally, if I'm commissioning a store or if I'm doing the EMS, if, it, if it's up to me to come up with those numbers and the customer doesn't care, I generally go with the rule of 76, 55. Now, when I say that, I mean fans off. I'm trying to maintain with the fans a 70 degree condensing temperature. So my fans are trying to maintain a 70 degree saturated condensing temperature. Now, then I try to maintain a, with my whole back, I'm trying to maintain a 60 degree condensing temperature. So I'm 10 degrees under my fans. So 60 degree, whatever that equates to in pressure. I'm trying to maintain a 60 degree condensing temperature and I like to get tighter with my A9s. I'm trying to maintain a 55 degree minimum liquid pressure. So I'm trying to maintain a 55 degree minimum liquid pressure on there. So that, that, that's what I, that's what I like to run on all my stuff. If, if it is, if I'm not having to apply to a customer spec, I have seen this a lot of, a lot of glider refrigerants here lately with, I know Brett was talking about using midpoint. So I, on certain situations, depending on the store, if, if I have an ORD valve, I am stuck at that 20 pound differential and I, I have to end up lowering my hold back usually a little bit. So I'll end up controlling my fans off of bubble point just, just to, just to get a little bit higher pressure out of the dancer so I could get my valves to trim out a little bit more. It's typically if I am only using a, that's a smaller system with an OR, with an A8 and an ORD valve. As far as having another diagnostic, making sure that you're, when you show up on a, on a rack call where, you know, you have multiple cases that are. You do want to make sure, obviously, if you have enough liquid, if you do see one of the things that you don't have any liquid in your receiver, you do want to check to make sure that it's not stacking in the condenser. Having, having a ill-adjusted holdback valve will do this. Having a, a VFD issue 
we this weekend someone called me up and and said that they were having liquid feed issues come to find out the pressure transducer was reading 130 pounds heavier than what it was supposed to be now, there's a scaling issue on the vfd because at that point the, the vfd was running at 100 percent changed the scaling issue all of a sudden he went from having five five percent receiver up to uh, 45 percent and of that case to start to come back down so you have to make sure just like we talked about on as simple as the single systems right if you have if you have a master and that headmaster is set for 100, 180 pounds you're not going to try to run your fans all the way down to 160 or your pressure all the way down to 160 because otherwise it's just going to come back in more for drain more for drain in there and then basically cause your receiver as well as your rep start Yeah, I mean, one thing I, I really understand in the wintertime is drop lake temperature. If your drop lake temperature is all the way down to ambient air temperature, generally you're probably holding back too much refrigerant and the fans are running. I mean, you're if you're getting a boatload of subcooling coming off that roof, I mean, yeah, in the wintertime you're going to have more subcooling, but if you're getting, say, like, if your drop lake temps down to, like, 40 degrees on a standard rack, we're not talking a floating head pressure rack, just a standard rack. Generally, your your fans are running. Your prob your holdback's probably a little high, or your receiver pressurization valve could be pushing too much liquid out of the the receiver. If that if that receiver's smoking, your head pressure's hot. I would I would be shutting that valve for a few minutes and seeing if that liquid comes back. And if that liquid comes back and everything kind of calms down, you're overfeeding on your receiver pressurization valve. And that's one thing to look at. I mean, that's it. I mean, guys will just go start jamming liquid into a rack when it's got a low receiver level and it could be your valves are fighting each other or it's hiding out in the split condenser. I mean, the last thing I want to do is start looking for a leak when there's no leaks or put refrigerant in there where you don't need it. I mean, so like I generally pay attention to what my, uh, my drop leak pressure is and then compare that to what the valve setting should be. And then I'll go feel the receiver pressurization valves line smoking hot and I'm running higher head pressure. I'm probably going to valve that valve off for like a good 10 minutes stint and see if everything kind of calms down. And if it does, you know that that valve's improperly adjusted and you need to reset that valve or rebuild that valve. Typically, I mean, I mean, they're pretty robust, but I just ran into this this week. Uh, we were doing new startup with some used equipment a customer supplied. No previous history of it. Stuff's pretty beat up. So we put it in. And, and first things first, I keep logging liquid on the roof, head pressure issues, high head pressure issues, inconsistent liquid pressures. So we pump it down. We take the AA valve apart and... It, Generally, what happens on these is you get a lot of carbon buildup on the piston section. So you should be able to push that piston down fairly easy. And uh, I can barely move with my fingers. So generally with these things, I mean, they're pretty robust. So some brake cleaner, a little bit of rag, and a new gasket. This thing's ready to go. I mean, that's generally what I mean. you see in there. Or you see copper shavings or something else blocking the piston. As soon as that piston was freed up, I mean, put, put it back together and the thing took off. And I was able to set it. So they're hunting all over the place. It could because of load issues. I've seen plenty of them where manufacturers size the whole back valve for the entire rack. There are compressor load, and you may only be running eighty percent of compressor load. And in the summertime, per design, and in the wintertime, you may only be running forty percent of compressor load. So I mean, that's going to leave you with an extremely oversized hold back valve. So on that point, I mean, you got to weigh your options out and see if. It's better to undersize the whole back valve a little bit. We've had to do that in the past. Is drop the whole back valve down a little bit. So it what, let me ask you a question. Like uh, typically, what what are you supposed to get uh, for as far as a normal drop across a accurately sized A8 or whole back valve? Like one PS5. I believe it's one to two pounds across. Like an accurately sized valve is what the, the sheet says. If you look at the sizing sheets, I mean, they, they, they list it for like one pound all the way up to like 10 or 15 pounds. I mean, you losing one or two PSI 
across the valve is nothing. I mean, you're not even going to notice one to two pounds of pressure loss across the valve compared to that valve swinging 10 to 15 pounds in the middle of winter time when we're already running like borderline super low delta P's to conserve as much energy and get as much on the system as you can. So, I mean, if you lose two pounds in the summertime to save, what, 10% in the, in the wintertime, I mean, that, that's a, that's a, oh, the only reason why I'm you're, you're in the money like it, there. You know, sometimes it's hard what. to kind of figure out if a valve is, if you're getting an intermittent call for a liquid level, I and mean, this just happened, it's winter time, so it's the season. Like three weeks ago, we, we were getting a call for a low liquid level this one particular store and I'm there just, just trying to see any, any, anything I could see. Unfortunately, there was no analog, analog thing that I could graph. It basically, it was just a digital set of closure for the alarm. So on, off, on, off. And basically I, I just saw what the pressure was running that morning. And I tried to simulate that, basically that pressure, drop the head pressure down to where it was and it ended up having an intermittent pressure drop across the valve anywhere from two to five PSI, even though it was well away, away than what the range was supposed to be. So let's just say the valve was supposed to be set for 125. I was all the way in the neighborhood of 175, 165, and I was having that that five, three to five pound drop all the time. And like it would go away, it seemed to be the higher I had the head pressure, Pressure up above a bunch of band and basically got my head pressure up even higher. The pressure drop would go away. And then all of a sudden I was running 10% receiver level now and back up to 45, 50. So I'm trying to figure out if you have a blocked or sticking valve, besides trying to open the stem all the way, switching the, if it's a Parker valve, there's a hex, hex bolt uh, or hex cover nut on the inlet side, basically that that will cause the valve to either go into full open where basically it's just the, the, no matter where you set the, 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 the set bolt at, it's not gonna, it's not gonna adjust to anything. Um, or you put it back in auto where basically, yeah, now it's going to be regulating all the time, but it's going to regulate to where, wherever you have that, that adjustment bolt. Basically I'm trying to you know, trying to get a little bit out of you to see, see what you, you do to try to figure out where you have pressure drop and maybe why and when, when to change. Yeah, I'll look at the pressure drop, but like if I, if I, like I, I was at a site today that was started up previously by another contractor and we got sent in there to kind of clean up the mess and before the store opened, the whole back valve was all over the place. Like I'd set it and I get it. It'd be sitting at like a 60 degree saturation. All of a sudden it'd be. 55 to 70 it'd be all over the place it was just it was hung like you could hear the valve whistling i know right then and there you it's whistling through the valve i mean the valve the valve was too far closed and it's just shutting and opening and shutting and opening and shutting and opening and i ran the numbers in the right the valve was over way oversized if, if, if it was oversized for full load operation well we're never going to we're never going to run full load operation. I mean, so I went to the customer with it and convinced them to make the manufacturer pay for us to drop the valve size down the next size port down. So that port allowed, dropping that port allowed that valve to operate. But a, instead of being like 5% open, it's it's now like 20 to 30% open. So it's... It's got more flow through the valve because the the porting the porting is smaller, so it's not shutting and opening. It's not hunting anymore. It, it's just holding a setting within like one. Oh, and you hear him refer to the, pressure. the port size, basically the the inner size of the of the cartridge of that particular valve. When replacing those valves, for instance, you'll see A8, UB, and you'll see port size inch and five eighths, but you the connect size two and one well that's that's not a snafu that's that's the way it's supposed to be they're they're not they don't need the full flow of that two and two and one or two and five whatever i said they, they figure out that they can use a smaller basically a smaller port size and still have that refrigerant flow needed swirl and selling with the same damn way i mean you have a model number on there me 
19, it's not 19 tons. It's just, it's just the port size, depending on what refrigerant is the same thing with the, the holdback valve. It's basically size per liquid temperature to liquid temperature. And is it, do they take the Delta P into consideration or no? No, it's just, it's liquid temperature, actual system capacity. And yeah, that's. So it's, it's system capacity, liquid temperature, evaporator temperature. That's how, that's how it's looking at its tonnage range. So you're better off with a, with a slightly undersized holdback valve than a oversized holdback valve, especially if it's an A8. I, I would, I would want it slightly undersized. It's going to give you better performance out of that valve. Oversized valve would be. That's that's pretty much at an A8 in any application. I'd rather have a little bit more pressure drop across the valve and that valve be a little more loaded and work better than a oversized valve. So if you see like a two and eight cord on a two and eight valve, I mean I'm pretty suspect of that. Like I'm gonna be looking at it and running the numbers on the rack. I mean, a lot of times these engineers oversize everything and they're already oversizing the rack. So say the rack's at eighty percent capacity. And uh, that extra twenty percent your buffer, they're sizing that holdback valve at a hundred percent. So that causes issues. We're not running that. I mean, especially in the winter time when we need this valve. So we need to undersize that valve a little bit. And so if you have one hunting all over the place, you don't want that. I mean, we we want steady pressure control. I mean, that's what that valve's for. So if it can't maintain steady. One thing I'm looking at right away is I'm going to run the sizing on it. If I think it's sticking, if it's if it's older or stuck wide open or stuck closed, I ain't doing nothing. I'm going to pull it apart and see. I mean, if it's a brand new store, generally there's copper shavings or something in it sticking up the piston. Or if it's older, I mean, oil breakdown, everything else inside there. I mean, you could easily get carbon on there, like which I found. I'll post the pictures when we send the podcast out of the one that I pulled apart. I mean, you could see plain as day, it's got gray carbon all over the shaft of the piston and that's causing, it was causing the valve. Uh, I think we covered all the, all the mechanical type valves for head pressure operation. I think the only thing we didn't touch on, we could probably sneak in is when they were using electronic valves for the same, same reason you want to do. Should we cover that real quick? Yeah, we can go through it real quick. We'll just do like a quick over. So the electronic valves, basically they're trying to, make, they replaced an A9 valve with a stepper valve. So just a CDS valve or AKB valve, whatever manufacturer you're using, Dan Foster, Sporlin or Alco, doesn't matter. They're taking, they're taking that valve out and they're putting a stepper valve in the spot and a pressure transducer. And they're just stepping that valve open or closed based on pressure. And then the, the what, was, what valve would they use for the receiver repressurization? Is that, is that not a CDS? I, I think was an SDR. Okay. The last couple I did, I was, used is CDS for. Did that have, have hard time controlling it? We'd use an SDR it's, valve. It's vapor. It, did have, it, it worked fine for me, but I, I've seen SDRs used also. The other, the other thing with that is you have to zero those valves out. So once a day, those things have to close and find their home. Or else they're going to have, uh, have a their condenser places. that's, uh, that's micro channel and you have a CDS valve for your holdback valve. Like you just said, it has to be zeroed out or it should be zeroed out at least once a week, but people, they, they like to do it once a day. We had, we had a customer that put that in and forgot that their condenser was was a micro channel and basically this rack would go off on head pressure every morning, every morning. And, and I thought I was doing something wrong for the startup. And I ended up having to talk to the, the programmers because I mean, everything was being coded when I was there, they were, they were basically writing some of the program while I was there. And, and we found out that oh, that's the valve resetting. So we actually had to install a bypass around the holdback valve. So whenever the unit would go and basically reseat itself, it would bypass that, that, that CDS valve for five, 10 seconds, go back into normal operation.
Yeah, I mean, that, that's a consideration you have to take with that. I mean, or you have to shut the entire rack down, which we don't want to do that. I mean, in the winter, it's not going to start back up. But that that's generally a, a brief overview on the electronic valves. I mean, they're becoming more and more prevalent. The, the last thing you want to cover is Parker actually makes a conversion kit for the A8s where you pull the port and the bonnet and everything out of the valve and leave the body there and just install a motor kit. So that, that A8 body doesn't have to be cut out or unbraced. You could just take the valve apart and install a motor a CDS motor kit on there that they make a conversion kit for, and you can keep that body in there and just control that electronic valve that way. All right. Any other diagnostic that stuff you want to go over? Oh, oh. What? I think that I think we hit it pretty good on that. I mean, we'll push some more diagnostic stuff. I think on the next one, I mean, it was a pretty good uh, overview of start, uh, uh, like causing some of this other stuff. We want to probably go through some split split operation. You know, we'll, we'll be asking to see if there's any other kind of requests they got see as far as different things that the subject they want us to go over. I know a service diagnostic was one of the big ones that guys wanted to see how you and I would go through a service call. I'm going to check yeah. out some of the Yeah, that would be, uh, uh, be a good Ellsworth. one. He had posted on Supermarket Tech Talk, and he was asking about, yeah, Texas, we've had record cold weather. This is the coldest it's been in probably 30 years down here, from my understanding. And he had a rack that was off for about 36 hours. So because it was off for so long, the refrigerant doesn't want to leave anywhere. And he's having a hard time building up head pressure. I saw the picture he posted where he basically was wrapping everything in a, in a big old tar. But one of the things you can do to help keep that head pressure in there is just wrap the connected fan shroud. You do that and it'll basically keep all the heat that we're generating and build that up and to build up the head pressure. Just get a little bit faster. Anything else you want to add to that? Right. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll throw that in here since I, I, I totally forgot to talk about it. So I'm up north. We get racks installed all the time up here for various reasons, but they're down for a while. So this is the easiest way to restart a stalled out rack in the wintertime. This is how I accomplish it. This is how I teach guys. So what I go in there and do is, especially if it has a receiver on the roof, it's even worse. All your gas is going to be sitting in that receiver and it's, it's going to be cool and it's not going to want to flow. You're going to get any flow and guys jamming contactors. That doesn't work. This is what I do. I go valve off the discharge lines going to the condenser. On the split and full side, I valve off the discharge lines. I will force a compressor on, and you need to be watching your head pressure while this is going on. Just make sure you're not going to enter a high head pressure situation. I will force all that gas through that into that receiver pressurization because if it's so if it's super cold, uh, at five eighths line will generally take all that compressor volume and it'll have enough flow. And what it does is it ends up put, putting a ton of pressure in that receiver. It warms that receiver up real quick and pushes that gas back into the store. And once you push that gas out of that receiver back into that store, generally that rack comes back to life and you can watch your head pressure. It's going to start popping up and then you can start opening your discharge lines up and that rack will just take off. I mean, I have yet to find a, a situation, a scenario where that did not restart that rack within like 10 minutes. Generally don't ever have to wrap them up here unless, unless we have some like se severe load issues. But I mean, restarting it that way. Uh, Preface that by making sure off. that you, you double, triple check your head pressure switches to make. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I mean, you need, you, you need to be either having a mechanical gauge on there or be be watching it like i mean you need to be watching it it's 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 dangerous but it's as long as everything's working properly you should be good I mean, but it'll restart a rack like right away like within like 10 minutes all that liquid will start flowing again and everything will take back off all right guys well i guess that wraps it up for podcast number two i appreciate you guys listening thanks for the positive feedback on the first one i guess till the next time <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
What did you expect? Welcome, Sonny. Make yourself at home. Marry my daughter. You've got to remember that these are just simple farmers. These are people of the land. The clap clay of the new west. <laughs> well, I just want to throw out a big thank you to Trevor Matthews. He went through some of the stuff from our original podcast and gave us some tips. Brother, I appreciate your time. Just want to throw that out for you. Thank you very much. You guys have a good one. Till the next one.